Hey guys, welcome back to this quick video. We This week we had on for Monday chat, we had on my agent, track and field agent, Paul Doyle. We talked a lot about growing the sport, what we can do to really change the sport, what, to, what it takes to make a difference in this sport, to grow it and continue to keep its relevance. Uh, I, I'm worried for the sport as it goes on, but Paul had a lot of good ideas, a lot of good recommendations, and, and like we kind of discussed, it starts from the top up and, and works its way down to, to us as athletes and you as fans. So appreciate all the support so far. Appreciate all the support on the past videos. Thank you for uh, for Paul for coming on and chatting with us. Link is below. We do all these chats live over on Twitch, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Three streams a week usually, give or take the days. You know how it is, the busy schedule. So appreciate it. Link is below. Make sure to hit that thumbs up if you do enjoy these kind of videos. Going to have more guests on more and more often. Thank you. All right, guys. So like I said before, post it on social, post it on here. We have a guest tonight. We have my agent super agent as the i don't think everyone's ever called you super agent but i'm going to call you super agent tonight uh <laughs> paul doyle it. i kind of posted a list of athletes that he has he can talk a little bit more about that um but thank you for joining us tonight mr doyle welcome to the stream for the first time and uh yeah. thanks for coming on well thanks for having me you get me out of doing the uh bedtime drill with the boys so all right so, that's not a, that's not a bad uh, game then that's not a bad no nope, no nope. No, my wife might think so, but I'm good with it. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit, start with kind of just uh, like, I guess, who you are, who you manage. Um, and then maybe after that, just kind of go into the real basic of like how you got into becoming a track and field agent or sports agent, I guess, in general, because you've managed just a little bit more than track and field as well over your, your lifetime. But maybe just tell us a little bit of background of who you are and credentials and stuff like that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Paul Doyle. I'm Clayton Murphy's agent. That need I say more? <laughs> no, I uh, I started off as an agent. I guess actually it was 21 years ago now, in 1999. Um, I had one athlete that I was coaching, Peter Cochran. He was a Irish hurdler out of Yale University, and to be honest, he wasn't that good. He was good, but he'd only broke uh, 14 seconds like three times in his life. And um, I started coaching him, and we tried to find a quote-unquote real agent for him, and uh, nobody was really willing to work with him. So I said, well, hey, it can't be rocket science. I'll figure this out. I'll be your agent. And, um, you know, that year he ended up running 13-3-0 and ranked number three in Europe. And then all of a sudden all these agents were lining up to represent him. And uh, we actually signed him to to Ray Flynn, and that was me done being an agent, so I thought. And then the next year in 2000, I had a bunch of athletes that were uh, either unhappy with their agent or needed an agent. And I started saying, well, you know what, this might be a good way for me to, to uh, travel with the athletes that I coach if I represent them too. So I decided, all right, let me be an agent as well so, so it can supplement my coaching. And then uh, two years later, I had about 25 athletes. And two years after that, at the 2004 Olympics, I had a couple of medalists, a bunch of medalists, and just kind of grew from there. So by 2005 or six, I was still coaching. But after 2006, I basically hung it up. Um, and that was when I hung up the coaching. And that coaching became more just a hobby um, and focused full time on the agency. Um, but that was sort of coincided with when I signed Asafa Powell. Uh, I signed him in December of 04, and it was really the 2005 season. I realized that being an agent to the world's fastest man and the world's greatest athlete at the time, I had Brian Clay, the uh, eventual Olympic champ in the decathlon. Um, it, it became too much to be on the track coaching every day, too. So coaching took a back seat, and things just grew from there. Um, you know, we've had we've had great success, um, you know, in in a broad range of events, um, mostly sprint based, I would say, and field event based. But we do have a handful of pretty good mid distance runners and distance runners. Um, but we're pretty, uh, pretty diverse uh, group of athletes. Yeah, I think we had uh, 15 medals in Rio, um, you know, the likes of Andre de Grasse, Ashton Eaton. 
Ryan Krauser, Sam Kendrick, Sandy Morris, uh, Tiana Bartlett at the time was with us and, you know, quite a few top, top athletes. Shelly Ann Fraser Price was with us and, uh, yeah, quite a few top athletes in a broad range of events. Yeah, just a few athletes. I remember like when we, we had our first conversation, um, I was like at first taken back by the number of athletes, but then I think you won me over by the way that you manage them. Um, Cause one, it's not just the number of athletes, but the number of quality athletes you have. And it was something that showed me that like, if you could keep the likes of guys like Ashton Eaton, Brian Clay, Asafa, then obviously you're doing something right. Otherwise, if you had too many athletes, those guys would never be with you. Yep. Yep. No, it's, it's, uh, I, as Ryan Krauser says, um, it, I'm, he says I'm one of those rare people that have a genetic ability to not sleep and still function. <laughs> um, you know, I average about four and a half hours of sleep every night. Um, actually, funny enough, now that we're talking about it, I have a Fitbit and it measures my sleep. And actually, last night I had a PB in sleep. I had a 91 sleep score, um, which is the highest I've ever had, and I'm exhausted today. <laughs> so. Yeah, you gotta you I'm gotta sure stop go, sleeping so much. Yeah, I'm sure I'll go right back to my four and a half hours tonight. And then you gotta stop good. sleeping so much. Yeah. So, <laughs> a quick side question: You are an athlete. You coached. Now you're an agent. What part of the sport of those three aspects do you enjoy the most? And you don't have to lie just because you're an agent now. What yeah. what of the three aspects did you enjoy the most or do enjoy the most? Being an athlete, number one. The only problem was I, I sucked. I have no talent whatsoever, <laughs> you know. I saw you but run the could, other weekend. It was, it's, let's just say the talent <laughs> hasn't come back. <laughs> yeah, no, if I could, obviously, if I could be an athlete and earn a living doing it, that would be my first choice. Um, and the coaching is something that um, I, I used to love, absolutely loved it. And then when I became an agent and doing the coaching and being an agent, the coaching became a little bit more of an annoyance just because I knew there was stuff I had to do for the management side of things. So I was always, I found myself always rushing at the track, trying to get out of there. But I think all things aside, if I could just be with an athlete and focus on that, not have to worry about anything else, I think I would still love being a coach. Um, but the agent, I love the agent side of things too. And, you know, like I said, I've been doing this for 21 years and no year is the same as another year. You know, constantly trying to evolve and do different things. And you've probably seen us doing a lot of new stuff with the media company world's greatest and stuff like that. And, you know, being an agent now is completely different than it was 10, 12 years ago. Oh, I'm you sure. Know, it's, I'm it's, sure. It's, it's, it's absolutely different. You guys are athletes. The athletes are different. They're more professional. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to say it out loud. A little bit softer. No, I'm just kidding. No, but honestly, like years ago, like we would we would go to U.S. Champs the second or third week of June, and then as soon as we got through U.S. Champs, we'd be straight to Europe from U.S. Champs, and wouldn't come back till the end of September. I used to always have. Now, I'd do have, you think? Put this way. Yeah. I have a question on that. You know, my I, birthday. Talk about... My birthday is September twenty second, and. I would still be in Europe for my birthday every year back in like 06, 07, 2006, 2007. And You're saying how the yeah, sport changes. Yeah. Do you think that that's mm -hmm. us becoming quote unquote softer? As you said, you, <laughs> you, you uh, oldies, but goldies, you would say you're using in our generation. Or do you think it's the way that the sport is now so strongly structured around such a, like a slim number of meets, whether that's world champs, Olympic games, Diamond League finals or a, a national championship for your respective country because the sport yeah, is, yeah. is so like highlighted by that few like meets. Do you think that's why that athletes will structure their schedules differently to perform at such an individual or yeah. such one meet a year versus an entire body of work? For for sure, that's a big big factor in this. But another big factor is the sort of evolution of the shoe contract. That was you like know, my next look, like caddy to yeah. that was like because the contracts are now structuring you around almost those meets more or less well no yeah but not only that but think about it this way if you're if you're an athlete that's back in those days nobody was getting huge huge deals you know it was very rare to have a six-figure contract back in the early 2000s um 
So if you're an athlete today that's making, say, a very high level athlete, say making a half million dollars on your shoe contract, and you're going over to finish third place at a diamond league on average, you know, that's $4,000. So that's less than 1% of your income for the year. Mm -hmm. If you go and finish third at a diamond league. So what's the motivation there? You know, obviously you have your minimum requirements that you need to fulfill in a shoe contract. Otherwise they wouldn't be sponsoring you. <laughs> right? right. But, but at the same point, you're right. Like the, the big meets are where you get the most exposure. That's what matters the most. I think, uh, you know, say a Nike or someone like that would be happy if their athlete won a gold medal at the Olympics and wouldn't care if they ran in five diamond leagues. They'd trade five diamond league wins for an Olympic gold a hundred times over. Well, it's also yeah. like, I think the athlete, like you're saying the athlete itself, because of the way contracts are structured, it's mm -hmm. more financially beneficial unless the meet itself is rewarding you to come financially. Yep. Like if you just base it off of public available figures of prize money um, yep. and what's kind of known through the grapevine, like a, like a big name athletes benefit is to run well when they can earn, like you're saying, those contractual bonuses and contractually sure. earn uh, like I'm not contractually earned, but like perform well enough to earn outside endorsement deals because they perform well at the meets that are where you're like the Olympic games and world championships. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, it's also less motivation. You know, there used to be more prize money in the meets. There used to be a lot more meets like nowadays. I mean, you Clayton yourself, you know, you've gone over to Europe. What's the most meets you've ever strung together on a European trip? It's, it's probably four, if that, maybe three or four. You know, but usually you're heading overseas now to hit, hit a pair of meets. But there used to be meets every other day in Europe, and a lot more of them, and they would pay a lot, pay really well. So those meets have dropped off a fair bit. So there's less motivation to get over there. And like you say, the performance is so crucial at the major championships and the trials and things like that, that athletes are being a lot more strategic and careful when they select their meets. But I used to have athletes, uh, Ty Akins is the guy we always talk about. He, he was uh, an NCAA champ and NCAA runner up, um, you know, about 12, 15 years ago. And he was a workhorse. He actually used to keep a, a carry on bag in the back of his car, in the trunk of his car, in case I called him. I mean, I, I tell this story. Hey, are we allowed to curse on this? <laughs> if, if limited, so. <laughs> limited, limited. Okay. So anyways, I, I call him up. It was, a, it was a Friday night and he was about to go out to a graduation party with his now wife at the time. And a lane had come open at the New York Diamond League at the last second. And I call him up and I, I looked on, one, on the computer real quick and I see there's a flight leaving in like two and a half hours. He lives in Auburn and he's an hour and a half to the Atlanta airport. So he could make this flight if he leaves right away. And uh, I call him up. He's backing out of his driveway. And I say, Ty, how quick can you get to the airport? And he just turns to his girlfriend at the time and goes, bitch, get out the car. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And he, and he headed straight to the airport. Like He was always on the ready. But he was the type of guy. You could actually, if you got any of the stats websites, go to like Tillis Tapia or something like that and look up Ty Akins. And you'll see he would do like he'd do meets on back to back days, one in Spain, Jeez. one in Germany. He'd travel and race same day. Like he was a workhorse. I think he yes. had something like forty-eight meets in a year or something like that. Someone gets like Jones, if someone gets like Lolo fifteen Jones. in this year, if fifteen in a year now, it's like oh, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Like Lolo Jones, had, I think had fifty-one or fifty-seven races one year. Jeez. I remember her running in Monaco. She ran the hurdles, crossed the finish line, walked right back to the start line, then ran the hundred. Like she was, she was a beast you when see it that came now. to all that. No, you barely no see way. anybody double now. Barely see anybody double. No, and, so, and that's why I look at like Asafa Powell, right? He has this world, this record for the most sub ten times ever. Right. He's yeah. Nine, Ninety-seven sub tens. I don't think that'll ever get broken. Not you know, today. I don't think today it's day and age, unless a guy like uh, unless a guy like Noah, who's super super young, who's breaking at such a young age, continually does it, like. Yeah, but multiple it, but times a year and has it in very 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 long career i'd say yeah, it's like more about length right of now. career than the number of races he does you know what i'm saying well but well it's the combination of both if you look at i haven't done the stats on it but i'm gonna guess 
at the current rate of sub tens that Noah's running, if he stays at that current rate, he'll be 48 years old when he breaks us off his record. <laughs> I wouldn't you know what I mean? Like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, Asafi used to crank out like 13, 13 sub tens a year. Easily. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. But so, anyways, it's a, it's a different time. So let's go back a little bit to the like a beginning of professional. We talked a little bit about the contracts, and I want to revisit the kind of contractual aspects of the sport a little bit for people because there's a lot of, I mean, there's been some articles put out by 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 Let's Run about just kind of like what people make and stuff like that, and I kind of want to visit that just a little bit of what we can. But go back to the start of like from your perspective as an agent, how does an athlete considered to be turning professional? maybe early or even after their normal like NCAA eligibility is up? Because a lot of people don't understand the process that goes through it. And I'm curious to hear your perspective as an agent of how you would consider an athlete's process to turn professional, um, either early through the NCAA system or high school or even like after the eligibility is over. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny that I've had some pair. I used to actually do a presentation at the indoor NCAAs. Every I've been year there. Where, I've sat through that. Oh, I, oh, yeah, that's right. That's where we first met, actually, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, where we talk about the steps in going pro and stuff like that. And I've had other parents tell me, I wish there was a book, How to Grow Pro and Track for Dummies, right? Um, because it's it's not as prevalent out there there's not that many people you can reach to especially if you're at a small school that hasn't had many athletes turn pro or still training there that you can ask about the process it's it's a bit of a daunting task for parents especially and then even the athletes themselves of course just trying to figure out the whole process and all that but you know if you're a collegiate athlete and you're considering going pro there's a lot of things that you need to factor in like number one how much money can i make (laughs) you know like Mm -hmm. You don't you don't want to go pro um, too early and and not capitalize uh, and that when you could have had another year and really capitalize and perform well. You know, I remember when Andre DeGrasse was making the decision to go pro. He had just run that nine seventy five or whatever it was, windy in nineteen seventy something, windy as well at the NCAA's. And I was talking with his coach about, you know, what he could make and stuff like that if he made the decision to go pro. And it's, of course, it's all speculative, but people talk and you have conversations with shoe companies and all that unofficially. But unless an athlete really knows what their value is or has at least some idea of what their value is, they should stay in school, you know, and and evaluate that. So Andre, for example, I, I said to his coach, this was sort of the kicker that got her to understand and said well what if next year there's a headwind at nationals and he has a minus 1.5 which can happen in eugene you know um and all of a sudden he wins ncaa's instead of a 975 he wins it in 1008 what's he worth then i said his money could actually be cut in half because of that you know and we'll look at like 2016 ncaa's versus uh 2016 and 17 versus like 18 18 was like on the women's finals day, it was a hurricane. Yeah. They ran the 100 in a hurricane in the yep. 200. Yep. Like, well, it actually, funny enough, it actually came to fruition that next year. Andre did make the right decision to go pro and he got paid a lot of money. The next year, it was a Jerry and Lawson actually won it with 1021. Yep. You know, it was, it was into a big headwind. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, it's the problem is this for an athlete, they don't know what they're worth. You know, I remember sitting down talking with Ashton Neaton when I was signing him. And I said to him, I said, Hey, Ashton, what do you think you're worth to a shoe company? And he said, Oh, I think I'm worth X. And well, first of all, he said, isn't that your job? I said, yeah, it's my job, but I want to know where you're coming yeah, that's from. That's what I said. I think it was probably my statement yeah. to you too. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he said, well, I don't know, maybe I'm worth X. And I said, Oh no, no, you should be able to get double that. He said, really? I'm a track athlete. And I said, no, you should get double that. And, Sure enough, it turns out we got more than double what I was saying he was going to get. Um, it, I mean, it just goes to show, you know, I've been doing this thing for 21 years and I can't always predict either. You know, you have to really get out there and test the market and see see where things are. But, you know, if an athlete is trying to make that decision to go pro, um, you'd want to have a really good understanding of what their value is in the current market. 
And that's why I look at this year, the, the poor kids that were, you know, coming out of NCAAs this year with the pandemic hitting and not having an outdoor season or even an in, indoor NCAAs, nobody got to set themselves apart. You know, it's almost like you start off every year and the shoe companies and the agents are all looking to see who the talent is that's going to emerge. No one got a chance to emerge this year. So very, very few athletes have actually made the decision to turn pro and, and done that. And you, you couple that with the fact that these shoe companies were all hit really hard by the pandemic on their sales and their stock dropping and things like that. And it's it's sort of like the perfect storm in the bad direction, <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. yeah, very few, very few opportunities right now for athletes. So, you know, I look at this year ahead and we're not starting off on the best foot with uh, fall sports being canceled, but I'm hopeful that winter sports won't be canceled and there'll be an indoor track season and there'll be an outdoor track season that where these athletes have a chance to show, show what they're capable of and, and hopefully get that value out of the, out of the Olympic games that will happen next year. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's just like, I think as an athlete coming out of college, just a lot of things that you don't see in that first conversation with your age or with a potential agent really opens your eyes to a lot of things. Cause you might, unless like you're saying you're in a system of like an Oregon or a USC or a Florida that's based around almost taking you from high school to college to the next level, like mm-hmm. a feed, almost like a feeder professional school. Like, and I was in the system. Yeah. I had a couple of pros training there. Coach Mitchell understood the professional process. Coach Labidi had had professionals in back in the day. Um, but there still wasn't a true like understanding of like the true science behind it as much as where, a school like Oregon or Florida or USC that has like that with Andre that can understand more or less when, when the go, how to prepare yourself, when to kind of create your image and brand that a company wants. Cause that's what you're, you're really trying to present yourself is you're trying to win over a company because they want to sign you as a, as a marketing asset to their company more or less. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. They're not signing you to, they're signing you to run fast and perform well and support you, but they're signing you to make them money in return by being a marketing asset and you have to create that brand. I think a lot of kids like maybe overlook early in their career because they're not necessarily looking forward to it, whether that's competing in different events or like adding credentials to their name. Um, Like that was why I didn't turn out any opportunities in 2015 to run at any of the U S opportunities because all I wanted to do was add credentials to my name of, even if it was like an easy NACAC silver medalist, it was still NACAC silver medalist next to the name on Wikipedia. And so I think a lot of kids that that's like one one tip that I've told kids before is like add as many like credentials to the end of your name in your introduction at a meet as possible because companies yeah. love to have you as an image of the brand that diversifies, mm-hmm. I guess. Yep. Yeah. And that's and don't don't forget NCAAs is a big marketing tool. <laughs> For sure. You know, it's uh, it's what drives it actually drives athletes social media up big time right now. You know, if you're an athlete that came through the NCAA system, chances are your your social media following is triple what other athletes are. You know, and that's no, what I've had. Yeah. I, yeah, I had a Canadian athlete one time, a 400 meter runner that had hadn't gone through the NCAA system, and he was a tough sell to the companies. <laughs> you know, he was a 44.4 guy in the 400 um and hadn't gone to ncaa's he was 19 years old running sub 45 and he was impressive and one of the top guys in the world but he didn't dem- command as much money as he could have had he gone through the ncaa system so, yeah that no, makes sense is you got to have that social media brand the presence that that when you wear their logo they they see a return on their investment that's all they're looking for mm-hmm. so absolutely eliminate covid we'll talk without covid um we'll talk about track and field currently as a whole without the fact of covid and we'll, we'll follow up with how covid is going to affect it going forward but how do you think the sport could improve in general not what's let's let's, let's take it one step at a time as like the contractual athletes revenue side of it um or meets revenue or like the financial side of it whether it's athletes contracts or meets paying like you're saying the prize money is less or bigger meets or, or sponsorships or how does the meet improve from that aspect to, to help grow the sport or change the contract structure to help more athletes become like more successful or more famous or, or how do you think the sport could change in that as- avenue to, to better improve it? I mean, the, the one word answer is media, media. 
we we have made a lot of mistakes in the sport from the top down um and i think we're really suffering from these what do you mistakes, consider the top apparently. what do you consider the top like from the world athletics gotcha okay. From, the, okay. from the very very top down um you look at let's look at tennis as a, a model and as an example so the, the wimbledon tournament the biggest tournament in the world mm -hmm. was on bbc over in the uk and every single home in in the uk has bbc on their television british broadcast channel so 44 million people can see bbc now sky sports which was a cable network that was emerging back in the their early 2000s came up and offered wimbledon three times the amount of money that the bbc was giving them and wimbledon turned it down and they said, what do you mean? We're offering you triple what BBC is paying you. He said, yeah, but you guys are in 10% of the homes in America, uh, sorry, in the UK. So if we go to you, our sponsors aren't going to be happy, you know, and we're not going to get the revenue for, on that side. So, but, but track and field did a very similar thing. Um, it, it certainly, at least at the US level, they went on NBC. They partnered with NBC uh, and got off of ESPN. So you look at the... 2016 season we ran a couple of american track league meets that were on espn and we had 379,000 viewers of our of our of our meets and they weren't promoted whatsoever you know yeah they, they were, were just, just basic almost basic track meets like you yeah, were like they, they were, were they weren't anything like out of the water yeah. they were they were solid track meets yeah solid track meets a little fun twist on it more light atmosphere and fun atmosphere but when i say promotion there was zero promotion on espn it wasn't like espn was advertising for this meet coming up and stuff like that literally the only promotion they did was if you went into the guide you could see it in the guide track and field you know <laughs> yeah that yeah. was the only promotion they did we had three hundred seventy nine thousand viewers so a few months earlier the world indoor championships that were held in portland were on nbc sports network you know how many viewers they had of a world championships held on American soil? No idea. 160,000. So we had two and a half times more viewers than the world indoor championships had because we were on ESPN versus NBC Sports Network. So we were in virtually, at the time, virtually every home in America had ESPN. I'll say Sports and Network is a cable channel that you have to have cable for as well as a lot of people don't get Sports Network included in their, like in the base package. You'd have to upgrade or potentially sometimes yeah. in other packages pay extra to, to be able to watch a sports network channel. Exactly. Exactly. So, so, you know, you want to go where the viewership is and where the eyeballs are. I mean, we're the number one sport in America, as far as participation numbers are, you know, but as far as television viewing, we're, we're almost non-existent. We're right behind cornhole these days. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, and, and you look at, from World Athletics, what they're doing. So World Athletics has Dentsu, which is a big advertising agency handling their marketing, right? But they have IMG selling their TV rights. It's not the same company. So IMG is trying to get as much money as possible. So they'll go to whoever's gonna pay them the most money and not even think about if the viewing figures are gonna be high or not. Whereas the marketing group, if the same group was marketing the sport, they would, they would have the sense to think about this and say, hey, no, let's be on BBC instead of Sky Sports. Let's be on ESPN instead of NBC and get, make sure we get the eyeballs watching. Because once we have the eyeballs watching, that's going to create more revenue for the sport. So I so think once a, a lot of that needs to change. These contracts need to be completed and move on and get a lot more people viewing our sport. So you're saying that more people viewing the sport will grow – what goes into athletes' pocket, what pays out at meets, what sponsorships put their names on a track and field meet, the amount of meets, like it all starts from the top up. I think a lot of people, and we've even discussed this on this channel with, with I've discussed it with Chad a little bit, is like how do we change, how do we improve the sport? And a lot of it's like minute details, like you're saying, like the more relaxed meets or whether it's new events or, or different things like that. But the problem is, and I've said it before, yeah, I want to see better quality productions of meats and I, i've criticized some broadcasts for the quality of meats um whether mm -hmm. that's like cameras or commentators or stats or just lack of graphics or 
whatever it is. But it doesn't matter if the big meets aren't really getting the viewers because it doesn't matter how bad your broadcast is. If you're only view, like you're saying, if if world if world indoors and in, in Portland is only going to 160,000 people, it doesn't matter how bad the yeah. broadcast is. It's only 160,000 people. It'd matter yeah. if it was if it was a million people and the broadcast was bad, people wouldn't come back. <laughs> yeah. You know, hundred the hundred and sixty thousand people who are watching are watching it because they love track and field, not because it just happened to be track and field on and they're like, Oh, I'm really interested by the sport, the broadcast is great and I'm watching it. Right, but that's the thing. We those people that do just happen to come across it, we need to entertain them. We need to, you know, get them excited about it and present it in a good way. Like I've watched the floor is lava. Have you watched that? Yes. Yes. It, it, it baffles me how much that has taken off. <laughs> you know. Yep. It's uh, I don't enjoy it. I mean, it's it's, but yet I find myself watching it. <laughs> you yep. know. But uh, no. Anyways, I I think I had this debate one time with somebody about that because they were saying to me the only thing that matters is having a good TV presentation. And everything I was doing with the American Track League was about the fan experience in the stadium. Yeah. And he said, Paul, you're missing the mark. It doesn't matter, the fan experience in the stadium. And he said, it only matters how it is on TV. And I said, yeah, you're right, but it can't appear good on TV if people aren't having a good time in the stadium to some extent. You know, like when we had music playing and people dancing and stuff like that, if people are watching on TV and they show crowd shots where people are dancing and having fun. They're like, Hey, this is, this is pretty cool. I want to be at one of these events. Yeah. I think it goes hand in hand. I think it goes hand in hand. Like you can't have a well broadcasted meet. That's not a good meet in person because the well broadcasted meet isn't seen as a, as a well run meet and you can't have a well run meet. It doesn't matter how well the meets run if you don't have people watching it on TV. So I think, I think yeah. there for sure is like, hand in hand. yeah, yeah, it goes hand in hand. Um, what do you think about, uh, I'm curious about your opinion about everything's moving to this subscription process of whether it's, it's NBC gold or flow track or whatever it is, or the, you have to yeah. have the Olympic channel. Do you think mm-hmm. that's just where the entire world of media is moving and track and field world just has to accept it and move on for what it is? Or do you think that that's something that's potentially hurting the sport in a model that could be changed for something that's better? No. So I think this is the first year that more homes will have streaming TV than regular TV. It's, it's actually making that shift this year. It's been creeping up very quickly over the past few years, but this is the first year they're saying it's going to uh, overtake regular TV, but yet, regular TV is still where most of the money is being made. Now, three years from now, that may be completely different, but right now- Is that because there's no commercials in streaming? Or the commercials are less in um, streaming? Like that's where the, the, the advertising money? Honestly, I think it's just the, the advertising buyers are stuck in trends. Gotcha, and makes sense. Sticking, sticking to what they're used to. Um, but it's, it's amazing how you know, I talked to a lot of media buyers and, and stuff like that, how, you know, putting an ad on a streaming service is catching up very quickly to an ad on traditional TV, but it's not there yet. Even though you're going to end up having more eyeballs watching something on a streaming service very soon, it's going to take a little while for things to catch up. And just because that's the trend, people people are used to paying a small amount of dollars for for ads on streaming service because it hadn't caught up yet. And it will catch up, but they're still going to need to be convinced and it's going to take a little bit of time. But my guess is that probably three to five years from now, having a having a 30-second com- commercial on linear TV will be the same cost as a 30-second commercial on a streaming service. Makes sense. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of agree with you. I don't think media. it's like yeah. – I think the problem is like what you're, what you're saying. That's the way the world is moving. But mm-hmm. – track and field itself is not at a position to i feel like support almost support it from a fan base or grow the sport Mm -hmm. from a fan base as a subscription model but the problem is Mm -hmm. that's where like the world is moving and track and field is kind of the product is lagging behind to to go with the trend the product's good everybody's going to subscribe and there'd be no complaints i feel like i feel like if the product was good coming behind behind your subscription there'd be no issues with that people don't complain about paying they're forty dollars a month for for cable because the product mm-hmm. they're receiving they feel like is worth that money. I feel like the where sure. the issue is is like it's not the subscription itself; it's the product you're presenting behind the subscription in the sport. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
but yeah well, so outside of the media and outside of from the top down world athletics like we kind of talked about a little bit about fan experience about the sport do you think like do you think the whole new events thing a lot of people talk about like adding new events or mixed gender stuff do you think that stuff helps or is it kind of a kind of a band-aid on something that's obviously like you're saying much bigger and it really doesn't affect it long it's not going to affect it long term yeah i mean i'm kind of on the fence a little bit about it you know i was it's certainly not going to be the difference maker that saves the sport it is something that's a little bit interesting but to be honest right now say you put on a an off event like a 300 instead of a 400 or a 200 right and you're getting the casual fan to watch do they even know that it's a different event they no. don't no. you know it's just is that it's one just, it's i feel like the fan you're winning over the fan you got to win yeah. over for this to be a long-term growth is like the kind of casual fan that's on the fence of whether or not they're a diehard fan or just like an olympic fan they understand yeah. the sport enough where like they they don't know but like putting on an off event, I don't know if like wins over any any fan in the long run. Yeah, I, I I don't think it does. You know, I think what's what was it? The one we did in Ostrava. I remember you were in Ostrava for the uh, Continental Cup. Yeah. And they did that. Um, the elimination the, stuff. The elimination stuff. Yeah, and that that became very comical for us true track people that were watching it. And but I, I don't, I'm not sure that that really made much of a difference to like you say the casual fan that's just coming in and you know that we're trying to draw into the sport it maybe almost made it more like a laughing stock yeah. you know um but yeah i think we sometimes get too gimmicky i think what these what the diamond league is trying and just did in stockholm with the long jump is does not make sense <laughs> the athletes no. are kind of all pissed off about it you, yeah. you're aware of what they did what i they had. saw the i was so i wasn't watching the meet but Social media was not happy. I'll we'll just put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I talked to Christian Taylor about it. He's like, this is this is asinine. It makes no sense. Like, the, you know, I, I saw the results at first. And I saw, okay, first place 809, second place 813, third place 801. I'm like, wait a second. That must be a typo. That must, yeah. have, been, must have meant to be 803. And then I realized, oh, no, that's right. They did that thing. Which, you know, I understand they're trying something new. And that's good. Like, let's try something new. But let's uh let's get the athletes feedback ahead of time i don't think there's any like i think you've got to create a product around someone that. running fast in an event that someone can recognize or someone can like yeah. relate to like yeah no one's going to relate to long jump anymore whether you're a diehard fan or a casual fan no one's going to relate to long jump more because of the structure of how someone wins i mean a normal yeah. long jump competition is super exciting to start with but you have to yeah. create that excitement for the broadcast if you're on the fence yeah. of that casual diehard and allow the athletes to perform well and create a product that you then present versus trying to man manipulate the athletes in their like yeah in the end like the relate the relatability of the sport or the event to somebody who yeah. has no understanding of what's going on because exactly what you're saying like if yeah. that athlete if there's somebody watching that event they're probably so confused because they're yeah. like, shouldn't that person have won or is it cumulative? And then they're going to go to the next per their friend and be like, I was watching track and field and I have no idea what happened. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, they can narrow it down to the last three jumpers and let them take their last three jumps, but still have all their jumps count. Like we, we messed with that one time on the American Track League where and basically in the first round, everyone jumped for the first two rounds and then we eliminated one person off the back so that at the end, in the last round, there were only three jumpers, but every mark counted throughout the thing. But you know that, that brings up another point. Like when you're doing that inside the stadium, when you got all these other events going on, can you really even follow it? Yeah, you know they, they don't do a good enough job on TV uh, following the field events. Which I think, if you look at Doha last year, those the field events were incredible. Like the men's pole vault, Sam Kendricks versus Mono Duplantis. The the shot put with all the big guys thrown, you know, top top three medals were all the furthest throw in the world for 30 years and what centimeter separated all, all the medals. Yeah, and then men's triple jump. Like a lot of these field events were followed really well in the stadium. And I remember that specifically the triple jump in the men's, men's triple jump, men's pole vault. When they finished, the stadium started emptying. And you had the women's 100-meter final right after the triple jump. 
and you had the men's 200 final right after the pole vault and about half the fans left because they, oh, the pole vault's over. You know, they, they like, you know, typically with tr within track and field, the running events take the, take the cake, right? They're the ones typically. that get the most notoriety typically. and all that. But for a, a lay fan, which is mostly what Doha was, when you look at the Qatari, people aren't track and field fans at all, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so they come in and they watch us. And the way, I think the, like a field event, that's top quality and really good competition doesn't necessarily matter what the marks are, but a really good competition can be really exciting if it's followed properly. Correct. You know, but if it, but if you look on American track and field and coverage and even diamond league coverage, most of the time um, you look and they have basically, Oh, here's a recap of the women's pole vault. And you know, Jen sure jumped this and then Sandy Morris jumped this. And then here's her missing her last attempt at something really high, <laughs> you know? And they, they don't give the way it unfolds and athletes having to pass bars and things like that, or Christian Taylor only qualifying for his final three jumps on his last attempt. And, and then, you know, taking over the lead, having the lead taken away and then him taking it back. Like those sort of things don't happen on TV. You don't see it on TV. Exactly. They happen in the stadium, but you don't see it on TV. So, you know, I'm not saying I know exactly what the solution is because I don't, but I think the field events can be, great standalone events if they're covered properly so i have one last question about this and then i have a few from chat and i'll let you go and the chat ones can be we can make the chat ones quick one last sure. long question here so i feel like as an athlete who watches a diamond league event on tv i get extremely bored watching it on tv because of the way the meat is structured for tv exactly what you're saying you can't do field events well and track events well at the same time because of timing camera to camera like jumping at the same time as a race yada yada yada. do you think that if a meet would structure itself around a tv production and i feel like they would still keep the integrity of inside the stadium and what i mean by that is say it's down to the final three people of long jump you put a gap in between the hundred and the next event but yet the track people are out on the track their blocks are ready to go for the 400 but before you start the 400, you allow Christian Taylor, Will Clay to go at it in a back-to-back -back triple jump attempt on their second attempt of the final round. You have them yep. to their two jumps. You highlight them. You really zone in on them. And as soon as they're done jumping, you go straight to the track. The athletes are in their blocks ready to go. The athletes cross the line. You go straight back to their third attempt of the triple jump. And you get it live. Mm -hmm. But you, you stagger the meet so that there's no big, like, 10 yeah. minute gaps between races and there's no field events going on or you don't even cover the field events because the field events are at like low heights or not exciting or yeah. whatever. Like, I feel like you can just create a product like that. Is that difficult for yeah, someone who's it, put together meets or is it, that something that's just like not really been looked at? No, it, it's, it is difficult. Um, it's not easy, but there it's possible to do. Um, but there'll be sacrifices as well. So, in order to have an event like that, one of the big issues is you got to have commercials on TV, right, to generate right, revenue. Right. So, but I remember years and years ago watching a, a track meet on TV and being so pissed off because they came back from a commercial break, and in the and coming back from the commercial break, they talked about Marion Jones's husband being caught for drugs, and the next event that was coming up. And then they went to commercial again. They didn't actually show a single competitive feat <laughs> it, until between commercials. They went right back to commercial again. Um, no, but I think a way to do that is to have less athletes in the field events so that you can give them longer gaps in between and, and keep checking back in. You'd have to slow down the event a little bit. Um, but then also having less field events so you can focus on it more. Like we yeah. tried that in the American Track League. We did... We did uh, two field events per meet. It was usually two field events and 10 running events. And the field events were at the start of the program and it was the only thing going on. And we would always pick two field events that could be held close to each other in the stadium. I remember in 2016, remember we did at Rice University uh, in Houston, we did a men's javelin and a women's pole vault. And we actually built the pole vault pit that crossed over the javelin sector <laughs> so that so that we could keep those events close to each other because the pole vault the uh, pole vault was on the far side of the track outside of the oval so we built that so we could bring all the fans down to that one location 
So the fans are all right there and you do those events so that that's the only thing people are watching, you know, and, and you like directing traffic. Okay. Javelin throws up, pull vaulters up, javelin throws up, pull vaulters up like that. So the fans could watch it. TV cameras could be right there. And then as soon as those field events are over, we hit the track and it's immediately one event after the other. So nobody watching on TV missed a single thing. Uh, and everyone in the stadium was able to focus in on the, the field events. And Do you I think there's being... also a sacrifice from athletes because of maybe say, like I was saying, maybe you run one running event and then you go to the field events and say, for whatever mm -hmm. reason, the field event takes two minutes longer. That athlete that's on the track now has to stand there for two longer minutes. I feel like that's a big thing that athletes would be like a big uproar about. Or say you have less time on the track prior to your event because, hey, you were supposed to go at 7 p.m., but hey, we got to get you yeah. guys off at 6.55, so we got to get you guys out there sooner. You only get one or two runouts versus your normal four, five, or six. Like, is that something that is yeah. another issue is like the athlete's yeah. happiness? But at the same time, I feel like an athlete's happiness could be balanced by a better product means it, better financial absolutely. benefits for the athlete. I think, I think the athletes, whenever we tried to do something new in American Track League, the athletes were always receptive. You know, they always liked it. They said, oh, this is interesting. Like, I remember one year we said, okay, we're not allowing any pole vaulters or high jumpers to pass bars. And then we also said, but once three people clear the bar, and say you're in the high jump and it's at 224, if three people have cleared it and you're up next to clear it, too late, we're moving up. Once three people clear it, we're moving up. We've got our medalists. We don't need any more at this height. You need hmm. to clear the next height. You know, so we did stuff like that. And the athletes were always super receptive to it. You know, so I think the athletes want that change and they want to, they want to get behind something that's going to make sense and help the sport. Uh, but, it, you know, other things that, that I think need to go like the cookie cutter way that they do an event where they go from lane one to lane two, introducing the athletes, you know, that's, they're spending three minutes so introducing much a, a 400 meter field when, when you got Will Clay and and Christian Taylor triple jumping across the field that aren't getting shown on TV. So we can see people yep. wink and smile and wave to the camera and no know? offense, like, but you have eight athletes in, in a higher quality fields. Well, it's, it's the higher end and the lower end or, or but if you go to a middle of the road meet, you usually have mm -hmm. one to three athletes who are your highlight athletes and yeah, everybody yeah. else in the race needs their potential face time, but you can introduce them in a very simple way but really highlight the athletes who are people recognize and connect with. So yeah, I, I see what you're yeah. saying. Like, I think, I think the three things, like we said, are just from the top down the media, I think creating a TV product that people want to stay in tune with and, and, and it's keeping yeah. the integrity of performance oriented connection to like a casual fan, I think are three things that like, yeah, are pretty important. So I have a few questions. Um, first one is, do you represent any marathoners? I'm just curious how that works with everything with deals and whatnot as a road runner, a marathoner. So I've heard there's a lot of money in marathon. <laughs> there is. <laughs> but that's I've why I potentially might it. run marathons at the end of my career. We'll, we'll, no, no. We'll yeah, get we'll into get it ourselves. No, honestly, <laughs> I don't, I don't represent road racers. Um, just because it's, it's a whole nother part of the season. I'm used to having a, a track and field season and having the fall off where I'm handling other things in the business. And, I don't want to be around the calendar traveling to meets and stuff like that. So I've made that decision not to represent road racers. Um, but from what I hear, it's very lucrative. <laughs> so, um, but I don't like Karen Locke, Federico Rosa, Ricky Sims does a little bit of road race management as well. Mostly with Mo Farah as he's gotten now Galen off the track a little bit. Yeah. Galen, that sort of thing. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know a whole lot about that, to be honest, just because I've never, never been in it. Um, next question is, can you just talk about a little bit of your perspective of kids going pro straight out of high school? Um, it, it, like I said before, you want to go when you can capitalize the most. And, you know, a lot of people have looked at a few of the athletes in the past that have gone pro out of school, out of high school and haven't really developed to beyond where they were. I mean, Candace Hill, Kaylin Whitney are a couple of the ones that have would be considered of maybe, maybe they made the wrong decision by going pro, but you know what? Maybe they didn't, maybe they would have gone off to college and, and not developed either, you know, or, or been stuck at the same level. You know, I, I just, I, I hate to point them out, but they're, 
sort of the obvious ones recently, but I, you know, you hope they are going to turn it around and, and still be successful. But at the same time, they capitalized on their highest market value at the time, you know? So yeah. Okay. Candace Hill or someone like that, maybe if they decided to go to college and didn't turn pro, maybe they run faster and develop more slowly with less pressure and stuff like that. And, and end up doing great, but maybe they don't. So it's hard to say if they've made a wrong decision or right decision. But so easy to be retro, it, retroactive or retroly looking back on those. Yeah, things. I mean, it could have been the same thing. They, they say. Yeah. Candace and Kalen could have been the exact same situation as Noah and just had success very early in their careers and and propelled themselves to be the best in the world. I mean, I think it's yeah. like what you're saying. Yeah. You could easily look back on it, but I think value and it's just like college. You gotta make a decision based on your your value and what you believe is best for you in the in the moment. And really that goes true with anything yep. in life. <laughs> like, yeah, you can really retroactive does. look it back really at like anything. Um, yeah. All right, one last question. This is uh, I'm gonna kind of add on to it a little bit, but it's like I'm curious if someone who studied media production and ran in college, what can people like us do to grow the sport? How can we be part of the solution? And I guess my next my third part of that question is like how could a die hard track and field fan who watches every diamond league who tweets about track and field or or follows a sport strongly how can they grow the sport or help grow the sport more than just like hey you guys should watch this meet yeah i mean i think blogging about it i know you've talked a lot about roster on your thing the fantasy yeah. track thing getting involved in that um but yeah be relentless with social media if you're really interested in media and doing it as a as a job i think trying to get involved with one of these companies or even starting your own uh video blog or or uh you know weekly piece about track and field stuff like that absolutely the more of that that comes together the better um, there's more eyes on the sport i think that's like yeah. how you do it whether it's more retweets or more shares or more original content it's like uh, more yeah. eyes on the sport um but well, i appreciate it absolutely you coming on sure. tonight probably have you on for a part two sometime and talk a little bit more about some stuff otherwise we could be yeah. here all night talking about the sport but i appreciate you coming on and sharing things and, and enlightening us in the chat all right man yep thanks for having me appreciate it thank you very much talk soon see ya all right chat appreciate it that was good i think there's a lot of things um i mean we've talked about on this channel a lot about growing the sport and what we can do and this is my way of helping grow the sport a little bit is uh <laughs> thanks for the follow emma appreciate it um but yeah i think that there's a lot of things that we can do whether it's uh like you said blogging whether that's guys like athlete special who are now getting contracts whether that's people like emma abrahamson go follow her on youtube she has a great channel that grows the sport she ran in college and continued to now vlog and grow the sport. Um, whether that's like, a, like he said, well, it's just tweeting about it. I feel like a lot of people can do that. Um, but I, I do agree a lot with him. I think there's a lot of things that that the sport can change from the top down and, and it's difficult to change the sport. It's difficult to change a sport without um, the, the top of the sport being in line with what the majority feels like the sport needs. I think this makes an extremely difficult time and extremely difficult battle to to keep the sport. I don't know a better word other than to use, which is unfortunate to use it. I hate to use it, but keep the sport relevant. It really is outside of the Olympic years. The sport's really not. Sports has difficulty being relevant. So I don't know. It's tough. It's almost I'm like disappointed that I had to use that word. But I appreciate the questions. 